Hello on the Rockers. On this episode, it's all color and light as we talk Sondheim, career, diversity, and spill the tea with Drama Desk award-winning screen and stage actor Larry Owens is here from A Strange Loop, Abbott Elementary, and Sondheimia, uh, and more, by the way, with my guest co-host, performer, and host of the very popular The Roundtable podcast, Robert Bannon is here, and me, your favorite host with the sassy most. Raise a glass, let the drinks begin. It's on the Rocks. <laughs> Thank you for being Life is a banquet And most poor suckers are starving to death I'd like to propose a toast This is On The Rocks with Alexander Where I drink with your favorite celebrities As we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture Reality TV And, well, that's about it So pop a cork, lean back And raise a glass to On The Rocks Fasten your seatbelt It's going to be a bumpy night Lord have mercy, buttons and bows and pantyhose on the rock podcast, the place where we're too glam to give a damn. Uh, we are zooming from home today, so I'm not wearing any pants. Uh, you guys, Barney is back. The purple dinosaur has been rebooted by Mattel. And let's just say he would not be out of place at a pride parade. Not that he had any issues with that before. Girl, he's super gay. Super, super gay. Yay, Barney. <laughs> um, all right, East Coast on the Rocks Live is coming to you. The ultimate podcast mashup with the Roundtable podcast with uh, guest playwright and drag icon Charles Bush and writer, columnist, performer Michael Musto uh, with my co-host Robert Bannon at the Green Room 42 next week, March 1st at 9.30 p.m. Come be in our live audience or you can live stream from anywhere you are. Also, I will be returning to the Green Room 42 for my one-man show, uh, <laughs> Unsung Midler, an irreverent evening of stories almost too hard to believe for my life, set to the great but lesser known or performed music of Bette Midler. I know, so, so, so gay. Uh, again, New York City, March 18th at 7 p.m., but you're going to see us first March 1st at 9.30 p.m., all at the Green Room. Head to Green Room 42 to get tickets for both. Uh, follow us on Instagram and on TikTok at On The Rocks On Air and on Facebook, On The Rocks Radio Show. Send me an email, book me for a wedding, funeral, quinceanera, bris, I don't care, I will show up. Info at on the rocks radio show.com. The show is presented by Straw Hut Media. You can watch and or listen to our now over 300 episodes at on the rocks radio show.com. You can watch us on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV on the out at TV app, Facebook Watch, streaming with pride on SVTV, and on Channel 31 in Boston, of all places. From Boston. Okay, let's get the show on the road. My co host today, no stranger to podcasting or performing on stage, just a stranger to relationships that last. Robert Bannon. <laughs> Actor singer Robert Bannon has been featured on NBC's Saturday Night Live, The Real Housewives of New Jersey, and Billions. He has performed in venues across the country with his unfinished business one man show, which was released as an album that debuted at number one on the Amazon AC chart. He has been asked to lend his voice to pride events around the country, including New York, New Jersey, Detroit, Ohio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And his pride anthem, I think he knew, has gone viral on YouTube. He is also host of the wildly popular podcast, The Roundtable, that in its first year has celebrated over 600,000 views and provided over 100 hours of programming with over 186 guests from Broadway, TV, film, music, and more. I'm jealous. <laughs> Robert and I will be co-hosting the Roundtable on the Rocks Live at the Green Room 42 in New York City, March 1st at 9.30 p.m. Please welcome Sassy Pants, Robert Bannon. Oh, sassy Pants? That's my stripper name. Hello. That's your grinder name, too, I found out. <laughs> <laughs> now, in addition to all that, you're also a teacher. Yes, but you have, wait, how many shows have you done? A, a million. <laughs> no, th uh, 300. 300? That's exhausted. I'm exhausted listening to what you're doing. I'm exhausted doing them. No. <laughs> I hear you. I do. I teach fifth grade in New Jersey, and then I'm an international superstar at 305. But no, it's it's really, really true. I talk to him like, oh my God, when do you have time for all this? Now, I just have to know, as a teacher, are you allowed to have a grinder? I mean, is that dangerous? <laughs> or we can't say, we can't say. <laughs> what I do in my personal life is what I do in my personal life. You're like at the PTA, okay, you're like, know. oh, daddy. And you're like, no, really, daddy. <laughs> well, can straight people be on Tinder? Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. As long as we're legal and of age and consensual and 
Yeah. And, and then, you know, we're not in Alexander. We're not coming into the class. We're not churning your students. The 100%. drag queens are not bringing you guns. We are, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm actually licensed in three states to watch children. Isn't that scary? scary. See, but I love that. I'm not even talking about the kids. I'm talking about like the dads who are straight dads and they're like, oh, the Mr. Bannon fantasy. <laughs> I want to see a totally straight dad, Alexander. I'm not convinced they exist. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. Um, but you are no stranger to performing on stages across the nation. I have to tell you, and this is, you know, getting a little serious. What makes me nervous in my boots is your performance at Pride Nights at mainstream events. You've been asked to sing the national anthem at many, many huge venues. With today's attacks on LGBTQ, um, I'm still so scared of being booed or even way worse um, at, at Pride Nights at quote unquote normal uh, events. You do it without, it seems, with, without any trepidation. You march out there and you sing your heart out. What was your first time like? Was it a little scary? Um, the first time I sang the national anthem, I sang it for the the, uh, the Knicks game. It was a playoff game at Madison Square Garden. I was 12 years old. It was 18,000 people. I wasn't scared because I was so young and you don't, you're, you're stupid and 12. When I do it recently, I did it for the Devils. The Devils sold out 18,000 people, hockey game, um, pride night, you know, hockey is for everyone you get you get nervous because yeah. you're in your rainbow pride shirt you have your rainbow pride jacket and you're going out there in an audience of these hockey fans yeah and you know you're and i think being out publicly teaching fifth grade and being out publicly singing and being out publicly doing pride events and putting it all together i think at my age of being turning 40 this year that I, I think that I have gotten to the point where I need to be, I'm so tired of, I didn't come out till I was 32, Alexander. What? I know it's shocking because I'm very butch and I very passable. And well, I mean, that's a funny term, but I would say, yes, you are passable. Well, thank you. I, I don't, I don't well, think that's not a thank with you that. Part. Welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Corky. <laughs> have you heard my version of Liza Minnelli? You wouldn't think that if you heard yes. it, yes. but I, I, <laughs> But I, you know, I it, it took me a really long time to, as corny as this sounds, to really accept and love and appreciate who I am. That now I feel like full throttle. Like this is what it is. And if you're with me, then great. And if you're not, then great. But I'm scared because the world is scary, and there's still a lot of. Um, and sometimes, you know, you're in LA, and I'm in the tri-state area. I think we get um, g like a little bit naive to the fact of what the world, what the country is really like. We live in a bubble until it takes one little poke to that bubble and your whole world can can be turned around. Now, as a teacher, you know, we were joking about being an open teacher, but the whole school system is becoming a very dangerous place for right. saying that you're gay. And now certain states are restricting that, even talking with your students about sexuality, not that you're, you know, sitting there promoting sex. But um, as a teacher, how scary is is seeing what's happening with our nation for you? Um, it's, it terrifies me. I've been very lucky that I've had a lot of students who have come out to me over the time. They have parents that don't accept them. They don't have students that don't accept them. I don't talk about my sexuality in school. We don't teach sexuality in school. I don't know why you're homeschooling. Your, well, if you're watching this show, you're probably not. But if you, why are you, what do you think we're doing in there? None of this is talked about. It's all, there's nothing spoken about. If this new curriculum that people talk about, it's just about inclusivity. Meaning there are students in my class who have two dads. There are students in my class that have two moms. We shouldn't be afraid to say he has two dads. No one is yeah. teaching sexuality in the classroom. It's scary because uh, a lot of families still don't accept their children. Um, a lot of students uh, don't understand what's going on. And the school in itself is become a scary place. And when I see the world and things that happen in the world, I look at it like the next day I have to go talk to 75 10 year olds and talk to them about gun violence in a school or there's an active shooter drill and we have to hide in the closet. And for the people who don't think that's a problem, I hope you can come talk to them because they look for answers and they're scared and we need to keep them safe. So I take as much as I joke, it's really important to try to create a environment where we, we keep kids safe and, and let them be who they are. Well, I want to talk about another environment that you do that with, and that is uh, the Roundtable podcast. Um, you know, you have such um, uh, such a nice, intimate approach to podcasting. It's not like we are now podcasting. You literally sit and you talk to these stars. And I'm talking about stars. It's not like, you know, you have the the piano teacher from down the street. You've had amazing personalities on your show. And the show's been around for a very short time. 
but you don't um you don't put on any airs you're literally just talking to these celebrities as 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 people um and what you get out of them um i think is is so joyful and it's such a safe space to talk about where we come from where we're going where entertainment is is coming from um but it is very different being uh, a podcaster as you know you, you and i are both performers putting on that podcast hat is so different number one it's a lot of work that a lot of people don't realize um, but then you're kind of having to remove yourself from the performance angle. Um, but I've learned a lot from talking to people. Um, I've learned a lot from listening to your show. What has been your biggest takeaway from some of your favorite guests on the show as a performer, but also just as a person? Well, you know, um, I've been on your show and you're a pro, pro, pro. You run a really pro operation and everyone needs to know that. We do not. It is in my <laughs> basement here in New Jersey. This is, it is what it is. And every time I do an episode, I talk to people, I am flabbergasted. It was a mistake. It was during the pandemic. I wanted to, I had a co-host at a time. We were talking to friends and it was not supposed to be serious. And then it just grew and kept going and going and going. And I think what I've learned, Alexander, and I'm sure you could talk about the same. When you're on stage, when you, we go see Alex in his show at Green Room 42 or in Palm Springs or wherever he is, you're going to see him do his routine. But when I'm hosting the podcast, that is, for me to look good as a host, it's not about me. It's about the guests and it's mm -hmm. about the audience. So I just try to be, think my mom is the only person that's watching. I'm having a conversation with another human being. And I am very curious about human behavior and how they got to where they are. And I really want to put the focus on them. I don't want to be like, well, when I was in fifth grade, can I tell you my story when I was in the wizard? Of no, no one wants to hear mine. That, you know, so I really just try I to. <laughs> I <laughs> I was the Tin Man and I dated Dorothy. It was the first time I was a friend of Dorothy. That was the start of it all. And that, <laughs> that was, that was, you know, it, I, I've learned so much about, um, and I'm sure we could tell our war stories about different interviewers. And there are some really famous people that I love who are so kind and humble and generous. And some people aren't. So I want to be somebody that when I get off your show, you say, he's great. Yeah. I don't want to be the other. Yeah. So you went from being a friend of Dorothy to stuffing the scarecrow. Okay, got it. <laughs> you know, it's funny, because even in my early uh, theater days, you know, you always end up dating whatever girl you were co-stars with or whatever. Um, my mom was always so freaked out, like, oh, my God. I'm like, now she looks back and she's like, oh, my God. She my should dad have been more concerned me. about the, the chorus boys. Yeah, my dad told me to date her. I dated Dorothy and took her to see the Brady Bunch sequel at the AMC Theater in Richfield Park, New Jersey. And we went to McDonald's. And she asked for her McDonald's to go, Alexander, because she said I didn't make a move. Bitch, I was not making a move. I don't... I'm Where's so Greg Brady? Over Greg Brady. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're going to get this show on the road. Uh, we have, of course, the wonderful Larry Owens. Now, you have worked with Larry. Oh, we, I sure have. We spent a summer in Sharon, Connecticut at the Sharon Playhouse. We did a modernized version of The Music Man. Modernized? Yes, we had cell phones and we had fans and we what had a disco. What do you talk? Yeah. <laughs> we had a disco shapoopy and that Larry sang. And after the first performance, we got a cease and desist letter from the estate of Meredith Wilson saying, you can't modernize it. You can't change the orchestrations. The New York Times wrote a piece and we had to change the whole show within a day. It was a talk about and uh that's like a movie. It was insane. I love it. I, I love it. Stuff. All right, Robert, are you ready? I am so ready. I love this next guest. I love I love Larry Owens. Larry Owens. It sounds like a name like should be like in Three's Company, like the like the neighbor that we never saw. Like Larry Owens, right? I, I love this name. All right, the man of the hour. Please introduce or please welcome Larry Owens, who won the Drama Desk and Lucia Lorto Best Actor Award for the original production of the Pulitzer Surprise winning A Strange Loop, continues his presentation of Sondheimia at Pasadena Playhouse February 27th and March 6th. Uh, he performed Sondheimia at Carnegie Hall, where he explored time, love, and ambition through the music and lyrics of the late Stephen Sondheim. He's also been seen, of course, on Abbott Elementary, Life and Beth, High Maintenance, Betty, Surge Party, in Craig Gillespie's film Dumb Money, and the upcoming Miramax feature Silent Retreat. Also, Little Birdie told me, maybe appearing alongside Tilda Swinton? I don't know. He's just everywhere. Please welcome Larry Owens. Hello. Thank you. All right. So we're all zooming from home. 
Um, and you're actually backstage. You're there for sound check, and you're getting ready to perform tonight at the Bourbon Room in Hollywood, which I love that space, by the way. Um, so thank you so much for squeezing us in. Backstage. Yes, absolutely. Show business. It never ends. Never, never ends. Okay, we're going to get right to it. I want to know about young Larry Owens. Coming from East Baltimore, of course, Hairspray was an inspiration for you, for getting into the biz. You studied at many different <laughs> places. There were performing arts camps. It seems like getting involved in such an early age, it seems that your family was pretty supportive of your career early on. Is that what yeah. we're <laughs> Yes, definitely. My my mom, she was supportive and you definitely helped the hairspray was set in Baltimore and that definitely I got that cast recording and I would play it at eight o'clock every night and pretend to be <laughs> at the Neil Simon. So definitely a precocious, adorable, theater loving youth. <laughs> No, I know, you know, growing up, like some parents are not like, oh, you know, they're like, okay, it's a phase or great. He likes musicals, but like you were really in it, such as, like I said, going to the performing arts camps. Um, was there any <laughs> feedback like, oh, why don't you think about being a lawyer? Why were you, why don't you do this? Or there was just never any question. Yeah, I mean, I never had any question, but I definitely had to go through the motions. Like I'm, I'm black, black American. And uh, so, you know, as like a little, you know, smart black boy, I definitely was supposed to, I think, be like, you know, a doctor or something. <laughs> like I was supposed to like use, use all of the education, but, you know, I just like to sing. I like to interpret <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, yeah, I went to stage door manor. And that's where I found other kids who were doing it, who were committing to it. And uh, a lot of them were working on Broadway and a TV and a movie. So I was like, oh, wait, like you just take your headshot and you go and you do it. And that's like, that was the story. <laughs> you just take your headshot and you go. That's it. The end. That Times a thousand, you know, it's like <laughs> you do that like a million times over that, you know, you could be in a show. But <laughs> I guess that's the third part. Now, Larry, I want to know, um, you have a very long time love affair with Stephen Sondheim, um, as did I growing up. But uh, first of all, do you remember what that first Sondheim piece was? Was it that you saw one of his shows? Was it a song that you heard? What was that Sondheim bug bite? I, I mean, it's just like literally in popular culture, like... Like you said, I, like I said, I was this, you know, I was in a lot of scholarship programs growing up. You know, I was, you know, trying to get fast tracked from the hood uh, to being, you know, like a nice, sensible, straight black dude. Um, but <laughs> instead, like when we, you know, when you play West Side Story alongside the Romeo and Juliet unit, you know, I was like, wait, this is crazy. You know, like, <laughs> wait, this is cool. I love and, and what I loved about musical theater was that it actually is like so many styles of music in one, in one score that like, you know, even a slightly score of like West Side Story, it's Bernstein, but you know, you have these like big rhapsodic ballads, but you also have these uh, Latin influenced time signatures, you have music in Spanish. So I like, that's what I was drawn to that breadth, I think initially. So West Side Story is in the background, you know, Mama Rose is like a part of like, you know, public lexicon and yeah, the, uh, Stage Door Manor, it's the setting of the movie Camp and they do, yep. uh, a lot of Sondheim in that show and that's where I was like oh wait this is like street cred like knowing Sondheim is street cred yeah. so <laughs> it's I, I like, remember that, that movie Camp that is a blast from the past yes Todd Graff IFC I I definitely I like going to the to the camp. I, I try to lie and say that I just found out about it on Google, but no, I saw camp and I wanted to go and made it happen. And it was it was like a saving grace and, and really Sondheim is currency. Like you got to know your stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's like a legit performer. Now I remember I I've been a Sondheim fan since I was very very young as well. Of course, I grew up in a little different generation than you did. A little bit older, little little, little bit. I remember thinking, God, I love this music, but I'm never going to do a Sondheim show because there was nobody um, uh, like like me that was in a Sondheim show. This was before, you know, we had this kind of boom in diverse casting. You have made such a splash in your career um, by being a nonconformist, stage screen, what have you. Did that 
just kind of happened to you early on? Did you ever think that you were going to be restricted by by race, by where you came from or anything like that? Or was that never even a question? Because it seems like you're such a confident uh, force to be reckoned with. <laughs> Well, thank you. I think, um, no, I definitely, like, I grew up with these, like, mixed messages. So, like, I grew up at the time of the, like, Rob Marshall Annie, where Audra McDonald is playing Grace Farrell, mm. and the Whitney Houston Cinderella, where, you know, the king and queen are Victor Garber and Whoopi Goldberg, and their son yeah. is Paolo Montalban. So, like, I actually thought that there was going to be this huge, like, opportunity for me to slay the classics and then when i like emerged from stage door like into new york like actually like i think sociopolitically to connect you know the theater to actually what is responding in our national culture like this was the bush era like these are like two bush eras like leading into the obama era like it and so like there actually i felt like there was a little bit of a step back from some of that and like things were very either fully fully you know black or or like whites only and i and i feel like the canon has been seen sort of in that latter category and and i just like i just feel like a part of the canon i feel like when i when i hear little red when i hear sally durant Plummer, when i hear you know charlie kringus like i'm hearing myself i'm hearing my peers i'm hearing my mother i'm hearing you know like people that I know, like people inside of me, like I feel so connected to it. And yeah, I don't care about the barriers. I care about what is connective, you know, like that's, that's like what an actor does. Like we take ourselves and a piece of work and we like find the middle of that Venn diagram. So that's like what my show represents. It represents the middle of the Venn diagram of the Black experience of the Sondheim experience, the 21st century artist experience at the Sondheim experience, the queer experience at the Sondheim experience, because a lot of those characters are straight. Well, and, and talking with about, you know, the queer experience, masculine and feminine, you know, you joke about coming from the hood, but that is a very real part of the culture um, I grew up in a very conservative kind of Mexican environment where even even involved in theater, sexuality was still not celebrated. It wasn't like out in the open. You, there were certain expectations. How did you kind of grow up through that? When did you kind of first realize like, oh, maybe I'm not like the other boys? LOL. No. So again, <laughs> a set stage door manner. It's like you're gay until proven otherwise. Like you literally have to be like, you can say you're straight, but unless you are like, have a, like a history of girlfriends <laughs> who confirm your straightness, like everyone there is gay. So like, I like, I, I didn't have to like come out in that one environment. And so that felt like a human experience again, like what we're searching for, like inside of this music, inside of these art experiences that we like, purchase and go to see like we're looking for that human thing and like i felt so human there and it's why i like prioritize theatrical spaces over other spaces that i was you know privy to like i like i did sort of have my pick but this uh this like this career it like it honestly like it picked me and it's like well suited <laughs> because of how accepting you know the community can be you, you know larry um, Larry, everybody, if you have not seen him on a stage, Larry Owens sings and dances his ass off from <laughs> stage left to stage right. I have had the privilege to work with Larry. I have had the privilege to see him cartwheel and flip and spin and twirl. <laughs> you put together this show and it took over Brooklyn. When I first heard of Larry Owens, everyone was like, "There's he's in Brooklyn. He has the show. Everyone needs to see it. You went from performing for 10 people to 50 people to 100 people to 1,000 people to Carnegie Hall, Larry. What? <laughs> Where did you come up with this idea? How did you get Jeremy O'Harris to get involved? How did the impetus of this start? Yeah, I mean, this show, it literally was like, I've always wanted to do something with the work of Stephen Sondheim because, like, you know, I've never actually even had an audition for a Sondheim show. Like, I've never been called in, like, to audition for a role. Like, it's, like, completely, like, outside of, like, what is considered for me. And so uh, I, I, I knew that I would like to do some sort of cabaret eventually in my career or concert experience. And Pandemic 
honestly allowed enough space to learn this many lyrics. Like I, like I was at home and I had so much time that I could <laughs> learn all of the words, like learn it confidently enough to not just like sing the song, but to like know the song. Like I have a really high bar of uh, textual analysis and like musical uh, analysis that like to that i want to bring to anything so if you're going to touch the work of like the the master of you know modern musical theater as we know it like you got to come correct so like so in pandemic i finally had time to come correct and uh, i like wrote an email to josh kite an amazing musician who i had you know like I like, oh my gosh, you have the gift. Like you can play any Sondheim song. Like, like you have the gift. <laughs> and so uh, I, I got over Zoom with Josh Kite and Cahoots and then Chip Miller, my co-director, like just, you know, figuring out the sequence of the show and the, and all of that, building it inside, like building it piece by piece. And then when it was time for us to come out and, you know, I did two test runs at 54 Below and when it was time for Carnegie Hall. Uh, Jeremy O'Harris, he just, he had done Circle Jerk, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and he truly, like, gave those artists the chance to just have free reign and, like, do what they want to do with this, like, slush fund from HBO. So it was just a no-brainer. It was, like, great, you know, Jeremy and HBO will pay for it, and then we'll sell it to the people, and, like, I wanted it to be accessible, so, like, all the tickets for Carnegie Hall were, like, 60 bucks or less. Like, it truly was, it wasn't meant to be exclusionary, it's meant, like, come one, come all, and it was this experiment, like, can I survive this show? Like, can I repeat the show like is it repeatable is it survivable do people want to see it and like people really want to see it like they keep coming back to the show like people will bring their parents like it's like this multi-generational thing mm-hmm. um people know me from comedy and they're like oh my gosh did you write this <laughs> like they have no idea who Stephen Sondheim is and so like that's like fun but like everyone is just getting this amazing concert storytelling experience that was so long well, and appearing at, at Carnegie Hall, I mean, talk about life going full circle in, in a, a relatively short period of time. And people work all their lives in the industry and never get to say, oh, you know, my show was at Carnegie Hall. I can't even imagine. Can you even remember what was going through your mind 20 minutes before Curtain, the first performance? And you're like, fuck, I'm at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it. Yeah, like those moments I like try to like actually leave my body. Like being like being present is like so overwhelming. Like it truly, you know, you get shot out of the cannon and then you just go and then you know, and I sing like for an hour straight and then I like return, you know, having just like given everything, hopefully. So I think it was a surreal out of body moment and and truly just like, you know having a moment of gratitude for the artists who like came in through the back door who like weren't allowed to like perform there for ages to not black people who were like not allowed to step on the stage for years and years of the hall's existence and then for like you said like to be at an early stage of my career with you know just like a small handful of highlights to like to headline this fame venue in uh, the amazing legacy of so many black artists and 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 yeah and like and not giving up the american canon because it's like not black but just saying like no this is our american culture like yeah. sondheim is like a theatrical american institution and as a black american like i have some stake in this and I have some stake in this and it doesn't matter if you ask me to audition or if like i'm invited to like you know be in the pageant concerts like this work lives on my body and like it will be heard as such which is fine <laughs> I, I absolutely love that so much. And, you know, we have seen Sondheim over and over uh, decades, reimagined, rebooted, jazzed up, stripped down. However, Sondheim has been served. It's been served. What keeps Sondheim fresh for you? And what about this show keeps Sondheim fresh for the audience? Yeah, absolutely. And it's just interpretations. Why didn't you have birth of interpretations? Like, I don't rearrange any of the music. There's no like, and now we take it to funky town, like gospel. <laughs> but I, but a big part of the feedback from the audience is that they've never heard the music 
interpreted this way that just like the uh, actual like interpretation and the approach to the music and the vessel for the music like makes it you know live and breathe in this like, really great way and you know like I-, I feel really honored to say that Stephen Sondheim got uh, watched me perform in a strange loop of playwrights horizons and although he wasn't able to see Sondheimia like just knowing that like I did a Pulitzer Prize winning play at playwrights where he did a Pulitzer Prize, you know, and like, and ours won like off Broadway. Like that's yeah. like, like that is just like an amazing conversation to be in just theatrically, historically to have shared that moment, like in New York together. And I, uh, you know, and I, I didn't want him to see it at, at 54 and below. Like I want him to see it, you know, at Carnegie hall or like when I truly knew it, like that felt like my preview period. So we didn't invite Mr. Sondheim to 54 below, but I know that, he's experiencing the music and that he, uh, that he loved a strange loop and that he loves innovation. Like you said, like he's, he's open to it. So I, I definitely appreciate the approach to the show that is like faithful, but also uh, rejuvenating. Well, and he, he is known for like, don't jazz out my songs. Uh, Betty Buckley told a story at one of the shows I saw where she was so excited and she sent him a recording of, of one of his songs reimagined and he left a message on her machine saying, don't do that. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but you, Larry, have been singing Sondheim for years. Like, if you want to stalk Larry on YouTube, I highly suggest it because you're going to get Chromatica, you're going to get Sondheim, you're going to get a strange, <laughs> you're going to get a little bit of everything. But some of the Sondheim YouTube videos are from seven, nine years ago where you've been singing Move On. I want to know, because your career has totally changed in the last decade. I want to know... Uh, what song that you have been singing for many years has changed the most for you emotionally, personally, but also professionally? I mean, Move On is is that song that like, re- like that was my first, what is on YouTube is my first, I think, solo performance at 54 Below. And like the the early days of that club where it like truly was like this, you know, like new important venue that like allowed people to be up close to artists in that way. And so that like, so move on, it does appear in Sandhemia in a very critical position of the show. And yeah, it's a song all about changing with time and the fact that like, yeah, that I change in time and that like, because of that, the way that the canon is refracted back also changes with time it's just like a really hyper meta moment that I just get to like keep collecting the memories of like singing move on like again and again and again at different points of my life emphasizing different points of the story and I ask you a question Larry about this growth and moving on you how I just, before this time runs out, I need to know, Alex, please give me one second. How the hell do you sit at a table with Madonna and talk about her tour? <laughs> Who gets that phone call? Does she get an email, a text message? Do you see the announcement of her greatest hit store? Madonna World Madonna. Tour. What the hell, Larry? Yes, I, I had a seat at the table. Yes, absolutely. I had a, yes, between Lil Wayne and Amy Schumer. <laughs> Eric Andre, Jack Black, Diplo, you know, it's just my, my BFFs. Uh, just Meg your posse. That's how <laughs> Madonna, you know. Bob the Drag Queen. Yeah, that was just like, it, it truly, I mean, what you see is what you get. Like, we were playing Truth or Dare with Madonna at Madonna's. Like, <laughs> I mean, between Madonna and Sondheim, do you even need to meet anybody else? I guess Meryl I mean, and then you're done. <laughs> sooner or later. Okay, right. Tracy reference. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. I am like so, uh, like, it, it's fun to do this, this interview to like talk about, to put it in perspective. Again, I like try to like stay out of the surreal moments because like I'm so grateful that they happen just more and more often. Like I get to like, go on set and work opposite legends and like create characters with them. I get to like be directed by like my amazing peers, like Julio Torres, like genius writer and author. Like I get to then step into for, you know, two nights in Pasadena. Like I get to headline a theater, you know, have like a show on a proscenium stage. Like it's crazy. Um, 
and like the in the how is like i don't know just like a ton of faith a ton of hard work and like really just keeping those blinders on and just like running the race let's let, let's talk about that that period of time when you moved from from baltimore you moved to new york around 2015 you know we've all done the summer camps we've all done the community theater we've all done theater in in our own environment but when you hit new york full time um or it happened with me la full time you're like okay i'm going to do this now um, it's a total shock because the er- the first auditions you do, the first kind of environment, getting used to living in, in a big city, um, it's not like the fun summer camp productions anymore. It's like, this is for real. What did you learn? <laughs> uh, what were some of your biggest obstacles and what did you learn real fast what to do or what not to do in your first year of hardcore New York? Yeah. I live here. I'm auditioning. <laughs> yeah no i like definitely i got to the city and i realized okay like dancers work first i was like okay so maybe you like want to go and learn how to do splits and you'll like you could get booked tomorrow um and i was like actually i don't want to do that like i actually want to uh, I want to I, I, I want to have an emphasis on character and on protagonizing and like and then I would go out for things and just realize okay no this isn't Brandy Cinderella this isn't Rob Marshall Annie like this is you know yeah. this is there's a line down between you know and then don't add type you know and dignity into it but um and then so I just really learned that like people were creating genius work and so I went to the Musical Theater Factory, which was a nonprofit started by the most amazing artist, Shakina Nafact, who is now directing and writing for Hollywood and television. Larry, can I just drop a little fun fact in there? Yeah. Um, Shakina and I went to high school together in conservative yes! Orange County. And I ran into <laughs> her celebrating her NBC episode that she just directed and wrote for Quantum Leap dealing with yes. youth. And I was like, oh my God, it's so, what a weird circle. Yes. Of life. Yes, this icon legend. And, and yeah. that is where I intersected with The Strange Loop and several other amazing musicals by artists. And that's truly where, like, day one of, like, development started of, like, of, like, Shakina's, you know, I came in with my with my 32 bars and Shakina was like, I know what you should be doing. And, like, it was like a match made with Michael. And, like, finally there was this role, you know, that answered all of my prayers. Like, that was the protagonist with dignity and complexity and sung a thousand notes, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, it was... <laughs> so, you know, but then you have to do that for five years. Like, you have to, like, do a reading and then wait six months, a year. You have to, like, you know grab another opportunity, fill the days. I started to do comedy, you know, and, and write. And this whole other life opened up alongside of like developing musical theater. So yeah, just the hyphens, you know, I got a lot of hyphens in the decade. <laughs> Larry, what I remember you were, he was not, this is going to be a bad word for a New Yorker. He didn't even, he didn't even live in New York. He was over the bridge in Jersey, struggled, working <laughs> and hustling. Yes. I was taking the chicken the bus. Pool. There you go. The hustle. I was I was taking the two dollar bus all over the bridge. Yes. Oh my gosh. To go and work for free at the factory with my binders, and I had my binders full of scores, and that was like enough. Like that, I was like, this is it. Like I was like, I am making musicals. <laughs> but I, I think that's so important for our audience to hear is like you have to do the hustle. You have to do things like that. There is no such thing as an overnight success. You know, when a strange loop hit, it was like a tornado. And it's like, oh, here's this boy wonder, you know, and instant success and bloom. It's like, <laughs> no, there was there's a lot of work leading up to, to, no. to this kind of experience. Yeah, I went to the Steppenwolf Theater Company. I said, teach me how to act, please, and do improv comedy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the most that was the most lucrative skill I learned was, you know, how to how to say yes and <laughs> well no, and so I have a question from an actor who sent it in is studying improv at Steppenwolf. Uh, what did you learn most from improv that has helped you transition from stage to screen? Oh my gosh. I mean, again, it is really like, I understand why it's included in the curriculum. Like not only is Chicago improv Mecca, it's where like all of the schools of thought started and originated, but for the actor, like that ability to like, if my teachers were Susan Messing and Michael Patrick Thornton, Michael Patrick Thornton's having an amazing run on Broadway right now. He's in the, um, he's in the new Chastain play and uh, he just did the Scottish play, but uh, oh my gosh. Just as I say it, I lose oh, my screen. Oh, is that weird? Oh, that is it, so it, weird. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? But um, 
But <laughs> oh, oh, see, look, oh my Most gosh, well, oh, see, and I made hey, a theater play too. Real fast. Into the woods. Uh, yes, there we okay, go. into the woods, into the woods. Yeah. <laughs> Another witch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but um, yeah, but really, just the ability to like have fun, keep it light, like keep it moving, like like this, like just where everything in life is truly like meant to be fun, even the craft, you know, like like we uh, we do this for the enjoyment of it to make people's lives better. So having that spirit, like underlaying everything, a spirit of play, like underlaying, especially when you do hard things on stage, especially when you're building serious worlds, like that can be a huge lesson. What did doing a strange loop teach you most uh, uh, as an actor? It just, it, it, it taught me a lot just about trusting the audiences. Like for years, like it was, a, it was a question, like even inside of me, like, like, can this be rendered in a way that people who don't live this story mm-hmm. specifically feel it? And just like the amount of trust to give over to the audience that, yes, just like the emotions of Sondheim graph onto this, like through the spirit of interpretation and performance, like so do those human emotions and the script and score. So that was just amazing just to be like, oh, my gosh, humans have the range. (laughs) (laughs) Love the range. Well, tour de force Uh, uh, to see it, it. You don't even know how much work he put on that stage and left blood, sweat, and tears on that stage every single night, truly. <laughs> oh, thank you. Larry, I want to talk about some of the choices that we uh, that we have to make as actors in terms of career. Um, and I know there's always a struggle between stage and screen. We know screen pays the bills. We know <laughs> screen can, you know, can really solidify a, a career. What advice do you have for an actor that's kind of maybe making that choice or maybe deciding you know, this is not right for me, or maybe it's time to leave a project. Maybe it's time to challenge myself and be scary a little bit and, and go for it. What kind of advice do you have? Because it's there's no uh, there's no clear decision to make. There's no guarantee in this business, whether it's stage or screen. Yeah, I think it's just like, it's like think of yourself as having a long career, like that just like you're going to do a hundred million things like and that's like what acting is it's like it's a new job every day you know like at the best of it it's like that just is the expectation so uh, don't think of it as one thing think of your career and your life as hundreds of amazing opportunities where you meet hundreds of thousands of new artistic families like the more the merrier you know like they're, you're gonna have so many amazing experiences and the goal is to truly have like more than less and you know when we're talking about Sondheim uh, I've been hearing Sondheim now as being classified as classic Broadway and that just made me fall off my chair it's like how old am I right I'm just like oh Sondheim's classic um you know but we continue to have new productions of Into the Woods we're having a new production of Sweeney Todd there's always an iteration of Sondheim around um what do you say to people say, oh, you know, Sondheim's classic. It's why is Sondheim still relevant to audiences over and over today? Yeah, I mean, I just think that it's it's very dense work. It's it's super dense. Like there's a ton of meaning in it, as is. There's a ton of meaning in it if you want to subvert it. There's a ton of meaning in it if you want to double down. Like there's like a lot of ways to, to approach this material. And I'm like glad that, you know, I grew up in the mid, in the middle of these things where like every Sondheim revival I've seen has been like deconstructed halves, these cutesies. And so like the idea of like, you know, a big scary Sweeney Todd, like is cool to me, you know, and even like, you know, re reimagine things, you know what I mean? Like we got it. We got a big company finally, you know, and not to, that the John Doe was small, but it was like, you know just a different concept yeah. so yeah and i think that when we start to really you know train actors of color on this material to like to like rise to the occasion of this material and like not just consider themselves like you know versions of like motown records you know which is like really good work you can get on broadway as a black person but like 
you know, there are a bunch of other lived experiences that are urbane and like fun and, and that are captured in this work of Stephen Sondheim. So <laughs> I think that it's a fun opportunity to just see more interpreters. What say you to the people that say uh, jukebox musicals and movie musicals and pop musicals are ruining the essence of what Broadway was? Um, what do you say to that kind of hot topic? I mean, honestly, uh, I would just say be good. Like, if it's like I like I don't care what type of musical you are if you're good. Like, I love the poppy musical. I love a jukebox musical if it's good. Like, Mamma Mia at the time that it was written. Oh my gosh! Like, it literally is Shakespearean. It's like we got three daddies, two women, and an island. Like, come on now, <laughs> like. <laughs> And the songs are like secretly dense as well, like the the lyric writing of that team ABBA. So I really am like a, a, I'm a dramatist, mm. and I uh, and I again I have the range to like accept work like for what it is on its own terms. When work gets condescending and uh, derivative, then I think that's more of what we should inter intervene on. Okay, I'm gonna bring up another hot topic. Um, you know, because we have one of the whitest of the white people I've ever met, which is Robert, is here on the show with us. <laughs> Robert, Robert, yes. Uh, it's like an Oreo the- cookie right now. That's what's happening. <laughs> so I want to talk about woke. You know, we've been talking about woke. It's a word that started off so well, and now it's kind of gotten this kind of negative attachment. Um, and there's been a lot of people saying that, you know, is there such a thing as too much wokeness in theater. If we do a theater piece for the sake of being woke, um, do you think there's ever such a thing as too woke in theater? Is that overshadowing a message of content or is it overshadowing maybe some of the quality of, of content that's being put out there because it's a hot topic, whether it's dealing with a hot topic or it's being represented with a cast that happens to be a hot topic? Yeah, I think it's all about quality. I think that like your show can have a message of any of of any good thing, and you know, like it has to be like rendered with sophistication and cloying, without 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 cloying, and also with timeliness. Like Broadway just takes a ton of time to develop anything for that stage and to raise the money. That like we have a different um, idea of timeliness in our lives because of cell phones, TikToks, Twitter. We can reach like these people so quickly in theatrical ways. Like you can make a song that goes viral you know, you know, faster than you can make a musical about today. So I think that it's just like a a functional, you know, error of like the forum. But I don't think that, I think that it's okay if theater works at a slower pace because that's what it is. And maybe that's what we'll appreciate about it is that it's not about churning ideas over super quickly to say I did it first but actually like letting ideas develop long enough to like really be worth putting in a theater. Mm. I don't know. If you, have you ever seen somebody give amazing pop culture references, jokes, improv impersonations, Larry does all of that. And now Larry, you're a part of pop culture because every time I turn on ABC and you pop up on Abbott elementary, (laughs) you have become a part of pop culture. You are the, there there you go. Oh my gosh. The infamous boy, and as an out school teacher who has dated his shit, beautiful black man, <laughs> Larry, I I see you. I know this part. I oh my gosh! I was asking Robert. I was like, "How real is Abbott Elementary?" And he's like, mm, mm, too real. <laughs> "Oh too my real. gosh!" How has it been to be a part of that? And how has it been now when you walking? You're walking around now. You're known as. The boyfriend of Abbott Elementary. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. It's so fun. It's so fun. I went to go see Newsies at the West End. And I was like at the stage door. I was like, oh my gosh, look at the dancers. And then this like little girl like like tugs my coach and says, excuse me. Oh, wow. She goes, excuse me. I think I recognize you from TV. <laughs> and I like was like, I was like, who does she think I am? Like, <laughs> like, uh, like she thinks that I'm Titus Burgess. But then like her, her mom like DM'd me and was like, we love Abbott Elementary. Like, so like that is a surreal moment to have like, you know, like a seven year old in a different country, you know, like being endeared towards you, you know? And like, that's like the brilliant part about that show and being asked to do it. Like, 
it was just like I like got the offer and like I read the role and it was just like everyone loves Zach. He's cute and sweet and nice. And I was like, I get to play this. Like we have come a long way. <laughs> like like every single like dream that I had, you know, like I was like finally doing network television, which like was like a goal in its own way, you know, to like be on something that my family in Baltimore in the hood can turn on without any barrier to and not only watch but because of like what the show is and like the genius of the show's setting and location is that they actually like enjoy it and can connect with it and identify with it so it's like you know I, i'm a very small part of the show a recurring guest star but in a very big way like yeah. it just like it means so much to be a part of and just you know yeah, just what a dream. What a dream. <laughs> Larry, uh, audiences love you. Press loves you. The industry loves you. What do you think it is about Larry Owens that people respond so strongly to? <laughs> what? Wow, what a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, cool. um, I think that what's fun is that like people like have their like slice. Like some people are like, oh my gosh, like comedian, like singer, you yeah. know, actor, like, you know, avid, you know, search party. Like people mm-hmm. have like their like different way of like getting to know me now. And I'm just excited to continue to just like synthesize that idea in my own work that, you know, has my own, you know, voice at the center of it. But it's just it's just really it's really loving and kind. And, uh, you know, I get to like on Monday, I get to go and like sing Sondheim for a clear hour with like you know an engaged audience of like yeah. LA peers and like new uh, new friends and new fans and and just yeah I'd like do my first big show here in LA which is exciting California West Coast uh, yes yeah, from New York to the West Coast <laughs> I mean that's insane so Larry Owens at Pasadena Playhouse uh, which is such a beautiful venue with such history it's one of the oldest theaters in Southern California February twenty seventh and March 6th. Um, you can go to uh, PasadenaPlayhouse.org for more information. Um, and Larry, where do you want us to find and follow you? Yeah, you can follow me online at Larry Owens Live. I'm so excited. I'm so excited for you, number one, being on my side of, of, of the U.S. Um, and just to see everything that you've accomplished so far and to see somebody that's remained so grounded, I think is so positive for our younger generation to see this joy and positivity that you have towards the industry, um, you know, while promoting uh, good, good energy. I, I love that. so Thank much. you. Well, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a long ways from the from the barn in Connecticut doing music, man. <laughs> And it, doing doing to disco realize- shapoopy. <laughs> Can I say, we were in the world's, I'm going to say it, and Larry doesn't have to agree, the weirdest version of the Music Man. Larry stole the show. He cartwheeled. We were in the New York Times. It was Playbill. The drama of it all. The drama of it all. Larry, it was the worst, messiest summer of my whole life. But we were- it was so fun. I had so much fun. I love summer stock. I want to do summer stock every year. I want to go to a town in Connecticut and just like live in a little farmhouse and, and do Meredith Wilson. <laughs> I'm following you then. I'm following you, but I'm not singing Barbershop Quartet Harmony ever again. Never. Wow, you were great. <laughs> you were great. You're great. You were great. <laughs> I'm going to spread Shapoopy all over the world. You, oh you my gosh. Lived. If you haven't seen Larry Owens Shapoopy at the stage door in <laughs> at his show next week, you ask him, demand him to do 16 bars of Shapoopy. And yeah, maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll put it on my uh, put it on my stories, I'll put yes. it on my Instagram stories. Yes. <laughs> for, for listeners of the pod. You are one of, I think that people resonate with you from my own little world because I think that you are one of the most authentic a people you are Larry Owens and you give Larry Owens and we see that in every single performance that you just are genuine and authentic <laughs> as you are and that speaks through all of the bull that is this industry you just come out and do what you do and you do it so well so congratulations thank you so much thank you thank you Larry go have a good sound check go have a good performance <laughs> uh, tonight at the Bourbon Room in Hollywood and we'll see you at Pasadena Playhouse and see you beyond. Pasadena Playhouse woo good night <laughs> Thank you, Larry. (laughs) All right, Robert, where can people find and follow you? 
Oh my goodness, you can follow me on Instagram at Robert M. Bannon because somebody in Canada took Robert Bannon. And how dare, who are they? It's a good name though. It sounds like it's a superhero. Like by I day, am, he's Robert Bannon. By night, he's like, I don't know, teacher extraordinaire. <laughs> I am not related to the guy who used to work at the White House though. No relation to Steve Bannon. You know what's funny? Because I pulled up, I was like, oh, I, I, I need a good promo shot of Robert. And I put in Bannon. I'm like, whoa, girl. No relation. No relation. <laughs> Leave Uncle Steve alone, Alexander. <laughs> All right, we can find you uh, at Robert Robert M. Bannon. Um, and where can we listen to your podcast, The Roundtable? Oh, you can find us on YouTube uh, at, at, at The Roundtable or Robert Bannon, the YouTube channel. And then you could also just go to robertbannon.com. Look at the shameless plug of it all. Fabulous. And you can catch me and Robert, uh, as you know, at March 1st at the Green Room 42. Um, and I'll be there again on March 18th. Uh, in addition, you can catch On the Rocks on the Road at Cathedral City for LGBTQ Days, March 3rd to the 5th. And I will be in San Francisco and Chelsea Table and Stage in New York in April for an evening on the Lanai, a behind the scenes show and fan Q&A with the Golden Girls, season one writer Stan Zimmerman. Um, and look for us taking the stage at Unleashed LGBTQ in Dallas in September. Details coming soon. All that's coming your way. We are on the road nonstop. I'm all excited. Um, and that's all, folks. It's always a grab bag of fun here every week on On the Rocks. Big thank you to our engineer, Tony Sweet, our social media clip editor, Alexis Mendez. Coming up, we have more theater coming your way with Julia Lester from Broadway's Into the Woods, the new production of The Secret Garden at the Amundsen, and Disney Plus's High School Musical, this series. And she's coming with her mom, who's also a veteran performer, Kelly Lester. Very excited. Please like, share, subscribe, so we continue bringing the show to you for free. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, stay sexy, stay tipsy. This has been another episode of On the Rocks. Tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On the Rocks On Air. Find everything On the Rocks for free at ontherocksradioshow.com. Subscribe, like, review, and share. Until next week, stay fabulous.